Hello everyone, welcome to Shankar Summary for Environment Part 1. In this video, we are going to cover 15 most important environment topics from June 2023 to October 2023. Displayed here are the topics that we are going to discuss today. We have also covered few other Shankar Summary. I will be giving the link in the description. Please do check it out. So let's begin the discussion. Look at this question. So let us understand this scheme and come back to this question. So MISTI stands for the Mangrove Initiative for Shoreline Habitats and Tangible Incomes. This scheme is a government-led initiative aimed at increasing the mangrove cover along the coastlines and on the salt band lines. The scheme is primarily focused on the Sundarbans Delta, Hooghly Estuary in West Bengal. The objective of the scheme is to conserve and restore the mangrove ecosystem which is critical to mitigating the effects of climate change, preventing coastal erosions and sustaining local livelihoods. Under the MISTI scheme, the government is providing financial assistance to the local communities to undertake mangrove plantation activities. The scheme also involves awareness campaigns to educate people about the importance of mangroves and their role in protecting the environment. The plantation activities are carried out in a participatory manner involving local communities and NGOs. This is to ensure sustainability and community ownership of the initiative. Overall, the MISTI scheme is a significant step towards promoting sustainable development and protecting the vulnerable coastal area of India. Note that the scheme is implemented under Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change while 80% of the project cost is borne by the Government of India, the remaining 20% of the project is contributed by the respective state governments. With reference to the Mangrove Initiative for Shoreline Habitats and Tangible Incomes, that is MISTI scheme, consider the following statements. The scheme primarily focuses on increasing mangrove cover in Sundarbans Delta and other coastal regions of India. This statement is correct. Next, it is implemented under Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. This statement is also correct. Next, the cost of the project is shared with 80% funded by the central government and 20% by the respective state governments. This statement is also correct. So the answer is option C, all three are correct. Look at this question. Here they are asking about Project Cheetah. So first, we will learn few things about this project and come back to this question. See, Project Cheetah is India's cheetah relocation program. The objective of this program is to bring in 5 to 10 animals every year until a self-sustaining population of about 35 cheetahs is established over the next decade. Unlike cheetahs in South Africa and Namibia that are living in fenced reserves, India's plan is to have them grow in natural, unfenced wild conditions. As of today, 11 of the translocated cheetahs are in true wild with 4 in specifically designed 1 square kilometer enclosures called BOMAS. These BOMAS will help the animals in adjusting to the conditions in India. 5 of the translocated animals and 3 of 4 cubs born in India have died so far. Talking about cheetah, cheetahs are the fastest mammals on the land. They can reach speeds up to 64 miles per per hour in just 3 seconds. Altogether, there are 5 subspecies of cheetah which includes Northwest African cheetah, East African cheetah, South African cheetah, Northeast African cheetah and Asiatic cheetah. See all cheetah subspecies listed as vulnerable by the IUCN except the Northwest African and Asiatic cheetah which are critically endangered at present. The Asiatic cheetah population in India was declared extinct in 1952. Presently, only around 100 Asiatic cheetahs survive in Iran. So the project Cheetah actually aims to in introduce African cheetah into the historical ranges of Asian cheetah. African cheetahs are chosen because of their genetic makeup which is similar to the Asiatic one. Know that cheetahs have a pale yellow coat with black dots on the upper parts and are white on the underbelly. Their faces are distinguished by prominent black lines that curve from the inner corner of each eye to the outer corner of the mouth. This black line keeps the sun out of the big cat's eyes while they hunt. They usually hunt during the day to avoid competition from other powerful predators like lions, hyenas and leopards. Female cheetahs hit sexual maturity around 22-24 months. After a 3 month gestation period that is around 93 days, a female cheetah usually gives birth to 3-5 to five cubs at a time. Adult females give birth in intervals of 17 to 20 months. But if cubs are lost or killed, she may mate and give birth sooner. Know that cheetahs in, in the wild have an average age span of 10 to 12 years. Cheetahs are social animals. They are usually found in groups consisting of either a mother or her young siblings or a coalition of males 
who live and hunt together adult females however tend to be solitary and only meet with males to mate so with these understanding about cheetah let us go back to the question now project cheetah initiated by india aims to reintroduce which species of cheetah into the country's historical ranges here the answer is option c south african cheetah see mangroves is one of the important topics that upsc is asking frequently look at these previous eight questions now let us solve this question after understanding what is mangroves see mangroves are salt tolerant plant communities since they cannot withstand freezing temperatures they mainly occur in tropical and subtropical regions of the world that is between the latitude of 24 degree north and 38 degree south within the tropical and subtropical region they mainly occur in intertidal zones here the intertidal zone is a area where the ocean meets the land between high and low tides these intertidal zones are marshy in conditions the conditions in the intertidal zone include lack of oxygen high salinity and diurnal tidal inundation these conditions are not ideal for normal plants to grow but the mangroves thrive in these conditions so how this is because the mangroves inhibit various morphological and physiological evolutionary adaptations to survive in these harsh conditions for example as i already said they are halophytous that is salt tolerant the trees that grow in mangrove forest are generally 8 to 20 meters high and these trees have thick leaves they have blind roots which are called nematophores these roots help these trees to respire in anaerobic soils apart from this the seeds of mangrove forests germinate in the trees itself before falling this is called viviparity mode of reproduction know that mangroves in swamps are known for their woody vegetation so they can help to cushion the blow of cyclones with their connected root system they also play an important role in controlling coastal erosion and since they provide habitat for a large number of birds fish invertebrates mammals and plants they help in conserving the biodiversity most importantly the mangroves play a major role in combating climate change according to the state of world mangroves 2022 report the mangroves hold up to four times the amount of carbon as same as some other ecosystems of similar size these are the significance of mangroves know that four major factors appear to limit the distribution of mangroves which includes climate salt water tidal fluctuation and soil type india has about 4992 square kilometer of mangroves according to the indian state of forest report 2021 mangrove in india are distributed across nine states and three union territories west bengal has the highest mangrove cover in india so with these understanding let us go back to the question now which of the following factors does not limit the distribution of mangroves here the answer is option b fresh water availability look at this question here they are asking about biologics and biosimilars so let us learn few basic things about them and come back to this question to have a better understanding about biosimilars we have to first learn about biologics Biologics refers to the biological medicines that have been developed from the living organisms like human animal microorganisms etc basically the biologics consist of sugars proteins nucleic acids or living entities like cells and tissues biologics are mostly developed using biotechnology methods like recombinant dna technology or using cutting edge technologies some of the examples of biologics include vaccines genes and some blood products like plasma and serum now how is biologics different from conventional drugs see most of the conventional drugs are developed using chemical synthesis methods here chemical synthesis refers to the process by which one or more chemical reactions are preferred to convert a raw material into a final product since conventional drugs are produced using chemical synthesis methods the structure of the drug is always identifiable this means that a finished conventional drug can be analyzed to determine all the various components of the drugs this factor helps the researchers to develop a conventional drug with similar composition but if we take the biologics most of the biologics are developed using biotechnology methods and they contain complex mixture of biological components from living organisms see some of the components of a finished biologics may be unknown therefore the biologics are not easily identifiable or characterized this is the main difference between the biologics and conventional drugs having understood this let us move on to see about biosimilars see biosimilar refers to the biological medicine that is highly similar to already approved biological medicine so we can say that biosimilars are an identical copy of already approved original biologics here 
the biologics when is used to develop biosimilar is called the reference product now talking about the problems with biosimilars as we saw already it is hard to identify the components present in biologics this is because biologics contain a complex mixture of biological components from living organisms so developing biosimilars with the help of biologics may end up in developing low standard drugs this is the main problems with the biosimilars now let us go back to the question with reference to the biologics and biosimilars consider the following statements biologics are complex mixtures of biological components that are developed using biotechnology methods and are difficult to fully characterize this statement is correct the main difference between biologics and conventional drugs is that biologics are derived from living organisms while conventional drugs are synthesized chemically this statement is also correct the main challenge in developing biosimilars is the difficulty in identifying all the components present in the reference biologic this statement is also correct here they are asking how many of the above statements are incorrect so the answer is option d none look at this question they are asking about blue ocean event which was in news recently so let us see some basics and come back to this question the term blue ocean event refers to the hypothetical event where arctic ocean experiences a complete absence of sea ice during summer months but why does this concept important see the volume of sea ice in the arctic region varies with season the volume becomes minimum around september each year if you notice the graph you can conclude that the overall volume of sea ice is declining with each passing year for the past 40 years this multi layer ice has shrunk from around 7 million square kilometer to 4 million square kilometer here what is multi year sea ice the ice which remains at the end of the summer is called as multi year sea ice this multi year sea ice is thicker than other seasonal ice and it plays an important role in combating climate change due to its thickness the multi year sea ice acts as a barrier to the transfer of both moisture and heat between the ocean and atmosphere thus preventing the positive feedback loop know that this climatically significant multi year sea ice is on the decline and when the area of multi year sea ice falls below 1 million square kilometer then blue ocean event is said to have occurred during the blue ocean event the arctic will appear blue instead of its characteristic white color due to the lack of ice this is all about blue ocean event and multi year ice the ipcc report published in 2021 predicted that the blue ocean event will happen in the middle of this century this is around 2050 but the recent study which was published in the magazine nature communication says that the next event will happen by 2030 even if we take our best measures to control climate change finally let us see the importance of arctic ice first is the role of arctic ice in climate regulation the arctic ice acts as a natural reflector known as the albedo effect it reflects a significant portion of the incoming solar radiation back into the space helping to reduce helping to regulate the global temperature secondly the arctic ice plays an important role in driving the global ocean circulation patterns the cold dense water produced from sea ice formation sinks to the ocean depths initiating a process known as thermohaline circulation or the ocean conveyor belt this circulation helps distribute the heat and nutrients throughout the world's ocean influencing the regional and global climatic patterns lastly the arctic ice provides a critical habitat for numerous species including polar bears seals walruses and other marine mammals these species rely on the ice for hunting breeding nesting and as platforms for accessing food sources these are some of the significance of the arctic sea ice with this let us go back to the question now the term blue ocean event recently in news is associated with which of the following so as we discussed the correct answer is option c the complete absence of sea ice in the arctic ocean during the summer months look at this question it is about the idea of compensatory afforestation so let us learn few things about compensatory afforestation and other forest conservation related matters and come back to this question see the concept of compensatory afforestation is quite simple suppose a forest land is diverted for a non forest purposes like industries or infrastructure development now the equivalent area of non forest land must be afforested we do this in order to compensate for the ecological services provided by the forest but we all know that this new afforested land will take time to mature and provide similar benefits like the original forest so to address this the forest conservation act of 1980 mandates the net present value that is npv of the diverted forest is calculated for a period of 50 years and this amount is recovered from the user agency responsible for the forest diversion know that 
NPV varies depending on the quality of the forest. It ranges from lower values of poorer quality for poor quality forest to higher values for very dense forest. Suppose there is a forest area of 100 hectares. It has to be divided for a development project. The forest is categorized as dense and high quality forest. So as per the Forest Conservation Act, the user agency responsible for the forest diversion will have to compensate for the loss. They have to pay the NPV for a period of 50 years. Know that an expert committee determines the NPV for each forest patch. Recently, recommendations have been made to revise NPV value to ensure adequate compensation. The user agencies are required to deposit the funds for compensatory afforestation and pay the NPV among other charges. Here note that the user agencies themselves are not responsible for the afforestation work. The state government takes charge and afforestation of afforestation activities. In short, the user agency bears the entire expenditure including the purchase of land while the state government eventually transfers the land to the forest department for maintenance and management. Now, how was CAMPA created? See, the Supreme Court in 2002 in Godavarman vs. Union of India case ordered the creation of CAMPA fund that is the National Compensatory Afforestation Fund Management and Planning Authority. It was established in 2004 to manage the Compensatory Afforestation Fund that is CAF and it acts as a custodian of CAMPA fund. Later, Compensatory Afforestation Fund CAF Act was passed, was enacted in 2016. Under this act, the National Compensatory Afforestation Fund and the State Compensatory Afforestation Fund are created. The funds are maintained under the public accounts of India and the public account of each state respectively. These funds receive payments for compensatory afforestation. The net present value of forest, that is NPV, and the other project specific payments. According to the regulations, 10% of funds collected go to the national fund while 90% is allocated to the state fund. This ensures that the funds are utilized at both national and state levels for the afforestation and related activities. Know that the utilization of funds is not limited only to compensatory afforestation. The CAF Act allows various projects and activities. This includes clearing of catchment areas, assisted natural regeneration, forest and wildlife management, infrastructure development, wildlife conservation, village relocation from protected areas, awareness and training programs, provisions of wood saving equipment and other related tasks. So with this understanding about afforestation funds, let us go back to the question. Now, what is the primary purpose of calculating the net present value that is NPV of the forest areas under the Forest Conservation Act of 1980? Here the answer is option B to compensate the ecological services provided by the original forest over a period of 50 years. Next topic. Now, look at this question. Here they are asking about carbon border adjustment mechanism, which was in news. So, let us learn a few basic things about them and come back to this question. So, what is carbon border adjustment mechanism? See, this is an initiative of European Union to prevent carbon leakage from imports. Under this mechanism, duties will be imposed on imported goods based on the carbon expended in producing them. So, the main objective of this mechanism is to avert carbon leakage. Now, what is carbon leakage? Carbon leakage happens when companies relocate the production or manufacturing of carbon intensive materials to countries with less stringent climate rules. This is done to avoid restrictions on carbon emissions in their home country. This means that instead of getting sequestered, carbon emissions are happening in another place. This is one definition of carbon leakage. According to European Union, carbon leakage happens also when products manufactured in European Union get replaced by carbon intensive products imported from other countries. That is, they are saying that companies of European Union meeting their emission standards. This is because According to European Union, products manufactured in the European Union will meet the emission standards, but the imported items will be produced without these conditions. So, European Union is saying that this also results in carbon leakage. In order to prevent this and reach climate change mitigation goals, European Union in 2021 came up with a proposal of carbon border adjustment mechanism. So, mainly this mechanism plans to impose a tariff on a set of carbon intensive imports. This tariff have to be paid by the European Union importers and companies who export such goods to European countries. This way, it covers both the definition of carbon leakage. Now, what is the significance of this mechanism? Firstly, it helps in achieving European Union's target of cutting greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030 and to net zero by 2050. Other such carbon control mechanism of European Union is the emission trading system. Secondly, it helps the European Union's domestic businesses to be on a fairer footing. This is because currently their domestic businesses faces a risk of being disadvantaged by 
cheaper carbon tax free imported products these are the two important significance of this mechanism finally how this mechanism impacts india see the impact of this mechanism are negative for most of the developing economies know that this mechanism will be initially applied to imports of certain goods whose production is carbon intensive for example such goods include cement iron and steel aluminium fertilizers electricity and hydrogen sectors for india impacts are projected to be significant for the cement and steel sectors under a carbon border adjustment mechanism scenario indian cement exports to the european union are projected to fall by around 65% and iron and steel by 58% in 2030 so india has invoked climate justice on the global fora saying that carbon border adjustment mechanism places a carbon charge on companies from countries that did not primarily or historically caused the climate change so that's all about this mechanism now let's move to the next topic now carbon border adjustment mechanism is related to which of the following here the answer is option b preventing carbon leakage by imposing tariffs on carbon intensive imports as we discussed it was an initiative of european union look at this question here they are asking about cloud seeding first let us learn few things about cloud seeding and come back to this question see cloud seeding is a way to modify clouds in order to increase the chance of precipitation like rain or snow we know clouds are made up of tiny water droplets when these droplets come together they form water vapor or ice crystals normally this water vapor is not dense enough so it will not fall to the ground as a rain it will simply rise into the sky and becomes super cooled which means it becomes very cold but remains in a liquid form now this super cooled water vapor should turn into a rain or snow for that it needs something to condense around this is where cloud seeding comes in cloud seeding involves adding small particles to the clouds these particles will act as a condensation nuclei these particles are often made of silver iodide this silver iodide basically provides a surface for the water vapor to condense on now talking about the process know that there are two common methods of cloud seeding one way is by using the large cannons that shoot particles into the sky the other way is by using airplanes that drop the particles from above once these particles are introduced into the clouds the super cooled water vapor condenses around them it then forms larger droplets now as more and more droplets come together they becomes heavier and larger they have become too heavy now they cannot stay suspended in the cloud so they fall to the ground as a rain or precipitation this is how cloud seeding helps to increase the chances of rain or snow now let's talk about the benefits of cloud seeding see cloud seeding has various uses in the different fields for example sky resorts use it to increase the snowfall because it will be great for skiing and winter sports then hydroelectric companies also use cloud seeding because more snow means more water runoff in the spring this can be used to generate electricity then cloud seeding can also be used to clear away to clear away fog by turning the fog into precipitation this helps in improving the visibility around airports and makes air air travel safer however there are some potential dangers to consider one of the concern is that the material used in cloud seeding that is silver iodide is toxic to aquatic life so when the precipitation from seeded cloud reaches the ground it can harm the environment so to address this concern scientists have been researching alternative materials that are less harmful to the environment such as calcium chloride finally it is important to note that the exact consequences of cloud seeding are not fully understood so with these basics let us go back to the question now with reference to cloud seeding consider the following statements silver iodide and calcium chloride are both materials used in cloud seeding this statement is correct one of the methods of cloud seeding involves using aeroplanes to disperse particles into clouds this statement is also correct all precipitation resulting from cloud seeding is harmful to aquatic life due to toxicity of silver iodide this statement is incorrect because there are some alternatives like calcium chloride are being researched for being less harmful they are asking how many of the above statements are correct so the answer is option b two only here they are asking about coral bleach let us learn few things about coral bleaching and come back to this question see corals form an important part of marine ecosystem they are colonial organisms composed of thousands to millions of individual polyps these coral polyps are tiny soft bodied animals each polyp secretes a hard exoskeleton made of calcium carbonate creating a protective structure called a coral skeleton or coral reef corals have a multi mutualistic or symbiotic relationship with photosynthetic algae called zooxanthellae these algae live within the coral tissues and provide the corals with 
essential nutrients through photosynthesis in return the corals offer you protected environment and access access to sunlight another interesting fact is zoo zonkle are also the reason for some colors in coral these are all some basic points about corals now what is coral bleaching coral bleaching happens when coral gets gets stressed by things very warm water this stress makes the colorful algae that is zoo zonkle that live inside the corals leave them when the algae go away the corals turn pale or white which is why it's called bleaching now what are the causes of coral bleaching the first cause is anthropogenic climate change human activities like burning fossil fuels release greenhouse greenhouse gases which trap the heat in the earth's atmosphere this causes the oceans to warm up putting coral at risk of bleaching the second one is pollution and some other causes are the pollution ocean acidification excessive sunlight exposure and physical damage so with this understanding about coral and coral bleaching let us go back to the question so which of the following factors is not a direct cause of coral bleaching here the answer is option d predation by the marine species all other options are correct excessive exposure to sunlight low tides physical damage from human activities next topic see crocodiles is one of the important topics of upsc look at these previous year questions so let us solve this question after understanding three important crocodile species of india now let's revise three indian crocodiles for the upcoming prelims first one is gharials see gharials are scientifically known as gavialis gangeticus these are large reptiles belonging to the crocodilian family distinct for their long narrow snout which is adapted for catching fish note that they are endemic to freshwater river systems of south asia originally gharials were found throughout the riverine ecosystems of india pakistan bangladesh and parts of bhutan and nepal in the 1940s there were estimated 5000 gharials in the wild but by 1976 this number had reduced to fewer than 200 this was due to habitat loss fishing practices that destroyed their nets and hunting for their skins this represented a decline of about 96% across their entire distribution range currently gharials are found in the tributaries of ganga river including girwa river of uttar pradesh son river of madhya pradesh ram ganga river of uttarakhand mahanadi river of odisha gantak river of bihar chambal river of uttar pradesh madhya pradesh and rajasthan to talk about their conservation status gharials are listed under schedule 1 of wildlife protection act 1972 also they are classified as critically endangered on the iucn red list among the three crocodilian species gharials are most adept at catching fishes due to their specialized snout note that katar niagad wildlife sanctuary which is located in uttar pradesh was among the first sanctuaries established to protect gharials particularly noting its breeding populations in the girwa river so this can be your potential prelims question next other important sanctuaries are listed here please have a look now know that kukarail gharial rehabilitation center which is located in lucknow uttar pradesh plays a significant role in the breeding and rehabilitation of gharials so that's all about gharials now let's see about salt water crocodile see salt water crocodiles are also known as estuarine crocodiles its scientific name is crocodilus porosus they are the largest living reptiles on the earth and a dominant predator on their environment Note that they are most ab- abundant in the regions such as Sundarbans of Bengal, Bidarganiga National Park in Odisha and Andaman Nicobar Islands. While predominantly found along the eastern coast of India, saltwater crocodiles are quite rare in other parts of the Indian subcontinent. To talk about their habitat, they thrive in the environment with brackish water such as mangrove swamps, estuaries, deltas and coastal waters. Saltwater crocodiles are the largest species of crocodilian and indeed the largest reptile in the world. Males can grow up to 6 to 7 meters long though larger specimens exceeding 7 meters have been reported. They have robust bodies, powerful jaws and strong tail which makes them formidable predators. To talk about their conservation status, they are listed as least concern by the IUCN and they are listed under appendix 1 of conservation on international trade in endangered species of wildlife fauna and flora that is sites. Also in India salt water crocodiles are protected under schedule 1 of wildlife protection act 1972 now let's learn about mugger crocodile see mugger crocodiles are also known as marsh crocodiles and scientifically known as crocodilus palustris they are found primarily on the indian subcontinent along with some parts of neighboring countries they are classified as vulnerable on the iucn led iucn red list due to their due to threats to their habitats and other environmental pressures and they are listed under appendix 1 of sites 
In India, muggers are protected under Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act. Now, talking about their distribution, muggers are distributed broadly across South Asia from Iran to India. In India, they are present in several states including Gujarat, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh and Maharashtra. These crocodiles favor freshwater ecosystems such as rivers, lakes and marshes. Mugger crocodiles are medium-sized compared to other crocodile species. Adults typically measure between 3 to 4 meters in length, although some can grow up to 5 meters. One distinctive feature of mugger crocodile is its broad snout, which is the widest among all crocodile species. Note that mugger croco- muggers are hole nesting crocodiles. They dig hole in sandy or river bank soils where they lay their eggs. This usually occurs during their during dry seasons. So that's all about mugger crocodiles. Now coming back to the question. Now, which riverine habitat in India is known conservation area for gharial? Here the answer is option B, Chambal River. Look at this question. Here they are asking about Ladvigia peruviana. Let us understand what is it and come back to this question. An invasive species refers to an organism which is not indigenous to a particular area. If such non-native species is introduced into a new area, it can cause great economic and environmental harm to that new area. In other words, the organism which is not native and has a potential to cause greater harm to the newly introduced area is termed as invasive species. An invasive species can be any kind of living organism like amphibians, amphibian, plant, insect, fish, fungus or bacteria. It even includes organisms, seeds or eggs. Now, do all non-native species can be termed as invasive species? Actually, no. See, not all non-native species are invasive. For example, certain crops grown in India like tobacco, chilies and potato were introduced by the Portuguese several centuries ago. These crops are not native to India, but they are also not invasive. So, what are all the conditions required to be invasive? See, there are certain criteria to declare a particular species as invasive species. Now, we will see them one by one. Firstly, a non-native species must adapt to the new area easily. Secondly, it should be able to reproduce quickly. And finally, the non-native species must harm property, the economy or the native plants and animals of the region. If these conditions are met by a particular non-native species, then it is termed as invasive species. Having understood this, let us see some of the important invasive species which are in India. The recent one which was in news was Ladvigia perivinia. This is an aquatic plant native to Central and South America. This plant is mostly distributed in Peru of South America, so it got its name Ladvigia periviana. Know that the plant live in freshwater region and can grow up to the height of height of 12 feet. The flower of Ladvigia periviana is pale yellowish in color. Some experts say that the Ladvigia periviana was probably introduced as an ornamental plant into India because of its beautiful tiny yellow flowers. Look at this image of Ladvigia peruviana. Next one is Lantana. See, Lantana is a flowering plant native to American tropics. It has become an invasive species in many parts of the world. Know that Lantana is toxic to livestock and difficult to control due to its proliferic seed production and ability to regrow from the roots. Next one is Parthenium or Parthenium hysterophorus. See, Parthenium hysterophorus, often called Parthenium weed, it originates from the Gulf of Mexico but has spread widely across the globe. It invades agricultural lands, reducing the crop yields and pasture quality due to its allelopathic properties that inhibit the growth of other plants. Parthenium also causes health problems in humans such as severe allergies and skin rashes. Next one is Siam weed. It is also known as Chromolena odorata. It is a fast growing perennial shrub shrub and it is native to North and South America and it is invasive in Southeast Asia. Know that Siam weed is also a fire hazard due to its high biomass accumulation. Next one is Mexican Devil. It is also known as Ajaratina adinophora. As the name suggests, it is native to Mexico but it has become invasive in many countries including India and Australia. It spreads rapidly in disturbed soils along the roadsides and waterways. Next one is Musquite. It is also known as Prosophis juliflora. It is a hardy tree native to South America but invasive in Africa, Asia and Australia. Know that it thrives in a arid condition and significantly alters the soil's chemistry and hydrology. So these are all some of the important invasive species which were in use. With this, let us come back to the question. Now, Ladvigia peruviana, which was recently in news, related to which of the following? As we saw, here the answer is option C. It is an invasive aquatic plant species. Next question. Look at this question. They are asking about Nilgiri tar, which was in news. So, let us understand few things about Nilgiri tar and come back to this question. See, Nilgiri tar is also known as Nilgiri ibex and are endemic to Western Ghats. 
Their habitat is mountain grasslands of Western Ghats and distributed between Nilgiris in the north to Kanyakumari in the south along the Western Ghats. Note that the Yeravikulam National Park has the largest population of Nilgiri Thar with more than 700 individuals. Some large populations are also found in Nilgiris and Anamalai Hills. So what are the threats faced by them? Most important threat is the habitat loss caused by deforestation. The hydroelectric projects in their habitat also endangers severely. Activities like monoculture plantations in the Western Ghats affect their survival because these plantations destroy the grasslands on which Nilgiri Thar feeds. They have competition with domestic livestock in search of food. Also, they were hunted for their meat and the skin. This drastically reduces their population over the years. As a result of deforestation and habitat fragmentation, Nilgiri Thar is classified as endangered species in IUCN Red List. Also, they are protected under Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. One interesting thing to note is that Nilgiri Thar is the state animal of Tamil Nadu. With this, let us go back to the question. So, which of the following statements is correct regarding the Nilgiri Thar? It is endemic to the Eastern Ghats of India. This statement is incorrect because it is endemic to Western Ghats. It is classified as vulnerable by the IUCN Red List. This statement is also incorrect because it is an endangered species under IUCN Red List. Next, Eravikulam National Park hosts the largest population of Nilgiri Thar. This statement is correct. Next, it is a state animal of Kerala. This statement is incorrect because it is a state animal of Tamil Nadu. So here the correct answer is option C. See, Pennaya River, which is also known as Ten Pennai in Tamil Nadu. The river originates in the Nandi Hills of Karnataka and flows through Tamil Nadu before emptying into the Bay of Bengal. Although the river mainly flows through Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, the small part of its drainage area is located in Andhra Pradesh. Now we will see the flow of the river. From its origin, the river Ponyar generally flows in the southern direction through the Kolar and Bangalore districts of Karnataka before entering the Dharmapuri district of Tamil Nadu. The river then flows generally in the southeasterly direction in the district of Dharmapuri, Velur, Tiruvannamalai, Kadalur and Vilapuram. The river then flows in the easterly direction below the Trikoilur Anikat before finding its way into Bay of Bengal. The river Ponnayar branches into two, the Gadilam and the Ponnayar below the Thirukoilur Anikat. The Gadilam joins the Bay of Bengal near Kadalur and the Ponnayar near the Union Territory of Pondicherry. On its way, the river receives a number of small streams and rivulets. Know that the river is dry for most part of the year. Water flows during the monsoon season when it is fed by the southwest monsoon in the catchment area and the northeast monsoon in Tamil Nadu. However, this water flow raises the water table throughout the river basin and feeds new numerous reservoirs and tanks. The major dams located along the river are Satanur Dam, Kelavarapalli Dam and Krishnagiri Dams. Currently, the river is severely polluted as the substantial part of Bangalore sewage enters this river via Balandur and Varthur lakes. So this is about the Ponnaya river. With this understanding, let us go back to the question. Now, the Ponnaya river, which was recently in news, is sharing borders with which of the following states? Okay, the answer is option C, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. Next topic. Now let's learn about a plant species which was in use, that is orchids. See, orchids are a diverse group of flowering plants that are known for their vibrant and colorful flowers. According to the publication by Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, India is a home to 1,256 species of orchid. Now let's learn about few important types of orchids which were in use. First one is epiphytic orchids. See, these orchids grow on another plants. Second is terrestrial orchids. These orchids grow on land and another one is mycoheterotrophic orchids. These orchids drive nutrients from the mycorrhizal fungi. Note that about 60% of all orchids found in India are epiphytic. The entire orchid family is listed under the appendix 2 of sites and therefore any trade of wild orchids is banned globally. Important thing to know is that the highest number of orchid species in India is present in Arunachal Pradesh. Western Ghats have high endemism of orchid species. However, Western Ghats also has high endemism of orchid species. So from this information, we know that orchids are highly distributed in Eastern Himalayas and Western Ghats. Despite this vast diversity, only 11 species of orchids are protected under the Wildlife Protection Act of India. With this understanding, we shall discuss about tiger orchids. See, the tiger orchids, which is now in news, are native to Southeast Asia. As the name suggests, the flower of these orchids look like skin of a tiger. The flowers have brown spots against a yellow backdrop reminding us of tigers. 
This orchid species is in news because it is now the season for its blooming and it is spotted at Botanical Garden in Palod. The important thing to note here is that this tiger orchid is the largest orchid species in the world. This orchid plant can have 80 to 100 flowers each. After 8 to 12 years of growth, they produce flowers in alternate years in its natural habitat. Also note that the tiger orchid species is native to Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Myanmar and Laos. Flowering states starts in June and lasts till August. Orchid lovers and researchers visit this institute during this. According to Guinness Book of World Records, these tiger orchids are the world's tallest orchids with specimens reaching heights of up to 7.62 meters. So with this understanding about orchids, let us go back to the question. Look at this question. Here they are asking about orchids in India. So there are different types of orchids which were in use. So let us understand about them and come back to this question. With reference to orchids in India, consider the following statements. More than half of the orchid species found in India are epiphytic. This statement is correct. The tiger orchid known for its large size and tiger skin like flowers is native to India. This statement is incorrect because it is native to Southeast Asia. Next, the highest density of orchid species in India is found in Arunachal Pradesh. This statement is correct. Next, all species of orchids are protected under the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. This statement is incorrect because only 11 species of orchids are protected under Wildlife Protection Act. Here they are asking how many of the above statements are correct. So the answer is option A. Two only. Here they are asking about white rumped vulture. See this was in use for various reasons. Let us discuss about white rumped vulture and come back to this question. See the white rumped vulture is a medium sized vulture species that is native to Indian subcontinent. It is commonly found in the countries such as Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia and southern Vietnam. It used to be present in southern China and Malaysia but unfortunately it is now extinct in these regions. Now talking about its habitat, white rumped vultures typically inhibit temperature areas including plains and occasionally hilly regions. They are often found near the human settlements such as cities, towns, villages and even slaughterhouses. These vultures prefer open areas with scattered trees. This is because they can easily spot and access carcasses which form their primary food sources. In terms of physical appearance, adult white rumped vultures are dark in color with blackish plumage. They have a white neck ruff and a white patch of feathers on the lower back and upper tail. This feature only gives them their name. The undersides of their wings are dark slate to brownish, but the white underwing coverts are highly visible during flight. Juveniles have a browner coloration and they do not have the white plumage found in adults. Talking about the reproduction, the breeding season of white rumped vultures occurs from October to March. They engage in monogamous mating, meaning they remain faithful to their partner and continue to breed exclusively with each other. Typically, only one egg is laid in each clutch and both parents participate in incubation, which lasts around 45 to 52 days. Talking about their behavior, white rumped vultures are social birds and live in flocks. They are diurnal, that is active during day. Their flight speed range from 50 to 55 miles per hour, but they can reach speeds up to 90 miles miles per hour. Also they can soar up to 9000 feet. These vultures play an important role in the ecosystem as scavengers. They help to clean up carcasses thereby they prevent the spread of diseases. However, they face numerous threats including disease, pesticides, environmental contamination, reduced food availability, habitat loss, hunting and collision with aircraft. In India, the decline in vulture populations has had a negative consequences. As the carcasses remain uneaten by vultures, this has led to a rise in feral dog populations. This further in results in the transmission of diseases like rabies to humans. Know that white rumped vultures are listed as critically endangered under IUCN red list. So that's all about this vulture. With this, let us move on to the next topic. So which of the following statements about white rumped vulture is correct? They are monogamous, typically mating with multiple partners throughout their lifetime. This statement is incorrect because it mates with only one partner throughout its lifetime. Next, they are primarily nocturnal birds, active mostly during night. This statement is incorrect because they are diurnal in nature. Next, they play a significant role in the ecosystem by scavenging on carcasses and thus helping prevent the spread of diseases. This statement is correct. Next one. They are currently listed as least concern on the IUCN red list. This statement is incorrect because it is listed as critically endangered in the IUCN red list. So here the correct answer is option C. So with this we come to the end of this summary discussion. The next summary will be posted on next Monday. If you like the video do like, share and subscribe to Shankar Academy. Thank you so much for watching.